What's up, y'all? Welcome to the National Entrepreneur Center and welcome to our monthly capital event. Uh, thanks so much for being here. My name is Zap, Z-A-P. I am the uh, capital connector at the National Entrepreneur Center, so my job is to educate uh, and connect founders to resources around capital. Uh, today we're certainly going to be talking about equity capital. Uh, and then outside of this, my passion is building the Nashville startup ecosystem, helping Nashville companies get funded, and being an angel investor myself and writing uh, perhaps the smallest check, that, but hopefully providing the most value. Uh, thanks so much for being here today. How it's going to work is I'm going to kind of chat with Tim for, we'll see how long we go, 30, 45 minutes. And then I would love audience Q&A, you know, throughout, if there's anything that you have a question about where you want to pop in. Uh, but uh, anyways, why don't we just give a big round of applause for Tim before I have him introduce himself. Thanks for being here, Tim. Happy to be here. Can we start actually with you just giving like the one to two minute of like, who is Tim Connors today before I like back into your whole history? Uh, so I run a venture capital fund called Pivot North Capital. Uh, been doing venture for 25 years now. Started out on Sand Hill Road at uh, Sequoia Capital and then US Venture Partners and then uh, had enough luck uh, along the way to have a track record to be able to raise my own fund, which I did now 13 years ago. So I'm usually first investor. Uh, I'll co-found a lot of the times. Um, usually try to be first check-in. Uh, founder with passion uh, for an unmet need. Sometimes they know what solution they want to build. Uh, sometimes they don't. Sometimes they built some software, sometimes they haven't. And, uh, and one of my uh, buddies who does something similar calls it frighteningly early investing. Uh, and that's what we like to do. So if you got traction and lots of funding already, awesome. Uh, you know, you're on your way. If, you, if you're early, early, uh, that's when I like to get involved. Yeah. Can you start by sharing how you got started in venture capital? I know it's a while back, but I want to hear that story yeah, too. Yeah, so I, I grew up in uh, Fort Wayne, Indiana. Um, and then I went to, uh, I'm the youngest of eight. Uh, half of my siblings went to uh, Purdue and half went to uh, Notre Dame. And my dad's only requirement was that you be an engineer. Because uh, he wasn't an engineer and he always wished he was an engineer. And he's like, you're financially set if you're an engineer, so go be an engineer. I don't care what you're passionate about, just be an engineer. Uh, so I, uh, I went to Notre Dame, studied electrical engineering. Uh, it was kind of a mix of uh, electrical engineering and computer science. They hadn't split them out yet. Uh, and I loved it. And then I went off to uh, Stanford, got a master's in uh, computer science. And then I went to work for a, a startup, or for a big company first, as an engineer. Uh, built some awesome uh, software. Uh, then I went to a little startup. Um, didn't know how to pick startups. Went to this little startup. And we ended up turning it into a public company. Um, and then it later got acquired uh, by LSI Logic. And uh, Sequoia Capital had been a funder of that company. I didn't, know, I didn't know who Sequoia Capital was. But I got to know a fellow named Pierre Lamond, one of my mentors, who uh, I thought had the best job in the world. He'd come in and coach us and help us. And I'm like, I want to do that job. So um, after that startup turned out to be a, a really nice success, VCs turn out to like you if you make them a lot of money. Uh, he's like, hey, come work with us when you're done with school. So started working with them. Um, uh, my first deal in venture turned out to be a, a unicorn, which was great. I'm like, oh, this job's easy. Uh, <laughs> took a while to get number to the, the next one. Um, and uh, and just, uh, then just got into venture. Loved working with founders, loved coaching founders. Um, didn't really love the culture on Sand Hill Road and some of the stuff that went on on Sand Hill Road. So, Can you tell the audience what Sand Hill Road is oh, in sorry. case they're not familiar? Okay, so the eco, the, for many, many years, if you wanted to do a startup, you had to do it in one of very few geographies. Um, the investors, the venture capital investors were in only a few places in the world, and you had to go to them and build around them. It's completely different now. But in the Bay Area, there's this, uh, this kind of nondescript road called Sand Hill Road, it's off of Highway 280, and uh, 15 years ago was where 95% of venture capital firms and dollars were. So back out in the Bay Area, it's kind of Sand Hill Road is kind of like, uh, you know, the 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 shorthand for the venture capital uh, kind of world. Awesome, thanks. 
Uh, I want to do a quick pulse check before we go any deeper. I would love to see like who in here is already working like full time on a business right now. Like raise your hand. Awesome. And then if you have just an idea that you're not full time on, do you mind raising your hand for that too? Cool. And then is there anyone who's interested in investing into startups? All right, we've got a total mix, mix here. Got cool. Mix. Awesome. Um, Tim, can you share more about your investment thesis of Pivot North and how you got to that, of like the theses you were investing in in the past versus what Pivot North looks at? Yeah, um, well, you want to, you, wanna, you know, fund things that make a lot of money at, at the core. If you don't do that, you don't, you don't get to stay in business for very long. Um, but then I look for companies, I found over my many years that the easiest way to build companies that are valuable are building companies that actually help your customer versus hurt your customer. Um, so I look for companies that do well while doing good with a capital G. So um, there's a lot of companies you can build that in the end really hurt people um, uh, versus help them. But I found the easiest way to recruit, uh, you know, recruit great talent uh, is uh, in companies that do good in the world because young people in particular want to work for companies with strong missions um, and the startups with the best talent tend to win. So if you have a company, if you have a choice of two investments, one, you know, does, you know, is Juul that, you know, gets kids addicted to nicotine or a sports betting startup that, you know, where 5% of sports bettors end up ruining their families with gambling addiction or a startup that helps vulnerable families make it to payday better, you know, I'll pick the latter one, right? So uh, there's plenty of investors who invest in the other groups. There's less investors for whatever reason that seem to pick the ones that do good, you know, do well while doing good. So I tend to focus there and, uh, and, uh, and I have a lot of fun doing it. Because when they work, it's not just, hey, we made a bunch of dough, but it's like, wow, we, we really changed the world for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And so you're industry agnostic, but you're always looking for companies where kind of part of the mission or the product they're delivering does good in the world. Um, yeah, yeah. So, you know, yeah, at any given time, so I'm what's called a generalist investor. Um, at different times, there's, there's uh, specialist investors. So many years ago, there were clean tech investors and all they did was clean tech. And that's, that can be lucrative for a short period of time, but it can be dangerous because you get too concentrated in one area. And then all of a sudden, there's, there's times when things switch. So as a generalist, I can be focused on specific areas at any given time, but then when the world shifts, I can, I can shift with the world, right? So um, 10 years ago, it was an awesome time to be doing uh, direct-to-consumer deals because Facebook emerged, and Facebook had more consumer attention than advertiser attention. So if you were an early advertiser on Facebook, you could pretty much sell anything on Facebook and make good unit economics on it. Uh, so that was a wonderful period of time uh, to build lots of interesting startups. Then Facebook got expensive. So then B2C sort of got harder. So then a lot of people shifted over to uh, enterprise buyers and more B2B models. Um, so it kind of shifts all the time. So you got to make sure in my world, I got to be thinking about what the world's going to look like in seven to 10 years and back in the founders now before it's obvious to everybody that this massive change is happening. So like now every investor is all excited about AI. Like I've been doing AI deals for eight years, right? Cause I gotta be way out in front of the trend, trend lines. And then for me, I just gotta be careful not to be too early cause being too early is just like being wrong. Yeah. Um, so it's a timing thing, but it's your constant always looking. Thankfully my wife is very, uh, very patient with me cause I'm constantly talking about what, what the world could be like and how do we make it happen. Um, so. And so, you know, your biggest criteria is you are looking for companies that do good in the world, but as a first check-in writer, how do you assess teams, companies, ideas when there's not much to show for it, let's say? Yeah, it's, you know, it's all f top five criteria are founder, 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 right? It's, <laughs> uh, and it's, there's some attributes that emerge, uh, you learn, founders are awesome. I love working with founders. Uh, you know, it's a crazy group of people in general. Uh, crazy smart, crazy passionate. Uh, many certifiably probably crazy if they, had, if they got diagnosed. Um, you know, it's kind of it, it's kind of a nutty thing to say, you know, okay, you know, I'm gonna start something from scratch. Because you, you don't, it's like stone soup. You don't really start with anything. 
but you start with an idea of, of an unmet need in the world that you're passionate to solve. And then 99% of the time, the founder's idea of the solution is wrong. So these days, I don't actually really care that much what their solution idea is. I care about, is the unmet need real? Is there a good answer to the why now question of what's changed in the world that allows a startup to solve that unmet need where you couldn't have solved it five or 10 years ago? And then do you have a founder with the right attributes to go iterate to find the solution? And it's those founder attributes. There's uh, my big three are smarts, goodness, and grit for founders. So smarts, startups, you just have a very limited amount of time, right? Um, you know, you're going to run out of money uh, at some point uh, if you don't get profitable. So you got to learn fast. So the best founders are just tend to be really just raw, intelligent, smart. Um, where they can just process data in their head fast, faster than the average person. Um, grit, you know, lots of opportunities to quit when a, uh, in startup land. And uh, the founders that win are founders that never quit. They the legs, when, when they go and get stuff, they just legs drive harder and harder and harder. Uh, and then goodness is kind of a few different attributes, empathy. Um, startups are ultimately an act of empathy. You're putting yourself in the shoes of the customer you want to serve and understanding their unmet need and how to solve their problem. Uh, you're empathizing with the people you want to recruit to your team to solve it with you and how to win them over um, to your way of thinking. So empathy uh, is a big deal, outsized empathy. Self-awareness is huge for founders. Uh, do you know what you know and know what you don't know and have the self-confidence to tell your coach? Um, I can help you if, you if you're honest with me. If you hide the bad news, and, uh, I can't help you. Um, and then moral compass. Uh, you know, when nobody's looking, do you always do the right thing? And that's the most tragic when you get a really bright founder that's got all the other attributes and you back them and then they do something uh, wrong when nobody's looking. And once, you, once they've proven that you can't trust them on one thing, it's hard to continue to work with them. And so I've just seen people just with tremendous opportunities um, that throw it all away because they just do the wrong thing when nobody's looking. So if you, if, you, if you have smarts, goodness, and grit, and you're passionate about some unmet need, most of the time we can figure out a, a, a solution to that problem to go start on. And then it's just an iteration process against a set of metrics until you have happy customers who love you and keep coming back over and over and where you can get to the customer for far less than the customer's willing to pay. And then, uh, then it all just works. Uh, and when it all just works, it's a lot of fun. Yeah. Can you share a specific story of a deal that you've done where like even the details of how you found that deal, what it was, the market conditions that you think, or the world, you know, what was going on in the world that you thought it was the right time for this and where it went, but just something super early. Uh, one that's liquid or one, one that's far along or an early one? One that's far along now. Okay. Um, so I grew up in a family, so I was the youngest of eight, as I said, and um, my dad had five kids by the time he finished college at night. And my mom stayed at home and raised us, and we didn't have any money. And uh, my parents did a good job of hiding it from us that they struggled to make it to payday. Um, we saw the obvious stress, um, uh, and the stress of having eight kids and not being able to make it to payday. I can't imagine the stress. And so um, my parents were always trying to find deals. Um, so they were, they were massive couponers. They, you know, it was all kinds of stuff. So the, as I got into venture, in, in, in tech is interesting because when you, when you have success, it's, it's kind of crazy how, how the numbers add up. And so you end up in a world where you don't struggle like 65, 70% of the US population struggles every day. But I came into it with a ton of empathy. And so what I saw was this really interesting thing happening in the banking world where when you would, um, you know, a, a vulnerable family working full time, trying to make it to payday, like my parents, would get two days from payday and you run out of money. And then your bank hits you with a $35 overdraft fee. And then usually people end up with one, two, three, four overdraft fees before they realize that they're overdrafting. 
And then they start the next pay period 100 bucks behind because of those crazy fees. So then they can just never catch up, never catch up. And then the banks pay you like almost no interest on your savings. So yeah, I, I, I analyze that market and it's always fun when you have a market that has massive market cap incumbents and negative NPS scores. So net promoter scores. So where the customers hate the companies, the incumbents, but yet they spend a lot of money at those incumbents because they don't have an alternative. So um, I saw that dynamic, I'm like, hmm, this is interesting. And then, so I wrote up, I write up these little two pagers of like, uh, you know, unmet need solution ideas. And I just keep a bunch of them, I got 30 of them at any given time, where I'm constantly trying to find a founder who, who's passionate for an unmet need. Um, and then I kind of keep my research there. So research this area of consumer banking. And I'm like, you have these massive companies, Bank of America, Chase, Wells Fargo, Capital One, are making money hand over fist, and they're ripping off their customers. Um, and uh, so I'm like, let's start a bank. We should be able to do this better, right? Facebook now exists. You can reach customers very inexpensively. So let's acquire customers not by having bricks and mortar buildings on every street corner like B of A, but let's do it online. And all the incumbents in banking told me I was crazy. Nobody's going to put their money on some online thing. You know, you got to have bricks and mortar so it's, you've got stability and all that kind of stuff. Well, it turns out young people distrust legacy institutions because they've gotten ripped off by a bunch of them. Uh, these days. So we went for it. I found, I, I researched my network, found a guy who had been um, at Green Dot, which was kind of a prepaid card that had uh, done some work with Walmart and it was kind of usury, but it was, it was kind of trying to innovate and um, shared my two pager with him. He got all excited. He, uh, he started thinking about it and we started trying to figure out who could be the starting team and, and we got started. and. Um, that company is now called uh, Chime.com, and it's uh, you've probably seen the TV ads or the little logos on the Mavs jerseys. Um, but it's now 25% of all new checking accounts each month in the U.S. are Chime Chime accounts, um, and we charge no fees, and we'll give you your paycheck a couple days early if you've got some direct deposit history. Um, no overdraft, no monthly maintenance fees, no nothing and make all our money when you use the card on the, uh, the debit card at Merchants, we get what's called interchange as the issuing bank. Phenomenal business model. So the merchants pay the interchange, um, we make all that money, and then our cost of customer acquisition uh, online relative to what we make per month is the key unit that worked well. So it's just scale. Now what's been beautiful is that that's turned out to be a really valuable business. And even better on top of that is the competition from Chime and the other neo banks that kind of fast followed us caused in the last two years, almost all the big banks have significantly eliminated or significantly reduced their overdraft fees. So B of A, Chase, well, so Elizabeth Warren's been yelling at the banks for 20 years to get rid of these junk fees and has, got, has not had success getting them to do it. We did it through competition. So now you got 100 million, you know, 100 million American families paid 50 billion less in overdraft fees last year all because of this little two-pager, you know, 12 years, 13 years, 12, 13 years ago. And so for me, it was just like, you know, I find the founder, help them get pointed in the right direction and try to have them forget I had anything to do with any of the original idea because a founder, it's gotta be their baby and they gotta run with it. So it's just fun to like help get those things started. I got another one now, real early stage one. We just closed a two and a half million dollar deal. I'm super excited. So if you look at the income statement of the average income American family, uh, you know, bank fees are 500 bucks a year. Uh, that's material uh, in terms of whether a family can make it to payday or not. But rent is their number one expense. And so I analyzed the apartment industry, housing for the vulnerable are, are apartments, not single family homes. And so I analyzed the apartment industry and found a lot of the same dynamics as the banking industry where you got these hugely valuable businesses, but you know, who loves their landlord? Right, nobody, right? It's kind of, you know, it's not a great world. And so I start, helped get a company started. Again, did the two-pager, found the founder, uh, backed them and, you know, letting them run. And, and so we're gonna try to build the US, the first 
consumer branded apartment uh, company in America. So there's Starbucks on every corner, there's Hampton Inns, you know, in every town. There's no national brand in apartments. But we're about seven million apartments behind in America. So when population grows faster than housing units, you get runaway pricing in apartments. And apartments are where service workers work. So then you get dynamics like Nashville where they have to live three counties away. The service workers gotta live th three counties away to get the jobs in Nashville. So if you can keep jobs and housing to match, then everybody's rent ends up lower. So uh, what we're gonna try to do is build those missing seven million apartments in America in the next decade. So my founder, it's awesome founder, he came out of SpaceX. So he built all the self-alignment uh, self systems for SpaceX rockets. So I had to put the little rocket segments together. You need to make sure there's mechanical alignment and, um, uh, and fuel alignment, right? So your fuel lines don't, don't leak. So he's applying that same technology to apartments. So uh, he's built this connector that you can basically build these uh, full apartments in factories. And the hotel industry has been doing it for a while. And then he uses his special technology. So basically, the modules show up on site and they basically get stacked like Legos. And then they mechanically self-align and then there's this connector you snap into place and you don't need on-site plumbers, electricians to get the building live. So we can take about 30% of the cost out of construction. So we can have all uh, low-income families in these buildings with uh, market rate financing. Um, and nobody's ever been able to do that combo before. And so we basically have unlimited access to capital with only affordable apartments that we can do at scale. So I funded them about two and a half years ago now. And our first building breaks ground in April. And we just closed another two and a half million dollar deal for 800 apartments in San Jose, California. Um, and once we get that first building live, then this industry is kind of, they kind of need to see the first building. Uh, but our goal is to build all the missing housing units in, in America. So have a, a Starbucks, so it's called cloud apartments. So to have the Starbucks of apartments where you love living there, right? It's a great experience. And uh, we don't have to build all the apartments in the country. We just have to build the missing apartments. And then all apartments will become cost effective. So if we can save the average family five, six, seven hundred a month on their housing costs, then tons and tons of families can thrive. So it's doing well while doing good. Great combo. And it's the largest industry in the world. It's housing. It's the number one expense for consumers. And I've never analyzed a market where 100% of supply didn't meet the demand. In most markets, there's, you know, like if you want a hotel room in Nashville tonight, there's 10 open hotel rooms for every person who wants one, right? There's tons of excess supply. In apartments, you have, you have more demand, there's more population than there's actual supply. And now with the big increase in immigration, the combination of birth rate and immigration, we're getting even further behind in having jobs and housing match. Um, so that's a early stage, same thing. So similar, just look at the income statement of the average income family, look at the incumbents, look at their MPS scores, identify all those places where you can make a lot of money and the incumbents are not doing a good job for the customer and then go innovate with technology to try to improve it. And you can apply that across any industry. Um, there's so many opportunities. And now with AI in particular, crazy productivity is happening in so many markets now with AI. It's probably the most excited I've ever been in my 25 years in venture. Um, we get a lot, of, we get a new kind of hypey thing every 18 months in tech, right? There's something new that everybody's talking about. Most of them are either hype, no, they're there or they're like 10 years away. And AI is like legit and real and ready and the productivity enhancements, unbelievable. And it's gonna be disruptive. So it's gotta be in the hands of people that wanna do good with it versus bad with it. Um, but overall, when you bring productivity up, you have a tendency to bring poverty rates way down. Um, and so it's gonna be a really positive thing ultimately. It's gonna be disruptive, but but positive. There's a lot of responsibility for those building it, but so much fun innovation going on right now. It's it's uh, it, it's an exciting time. Probably most exciting time I've seen in my 25 years. 
Tim, can you share more about, you know, you, you come from San Francisco, like this heart of innovation. You've been in Nashville for a year and a half. Um, and we're at the National Entrepreneur Center. What has your experience in the Nashville startup ecosystem been like? And I'm also curious to hear like what you think the challenges are, the opportunities, just your overall thoughts on it. Yeah, it's really fun. It's been really fun. I've, I've loved it. I grew up, you know, in Indiana, so kind of felt more at home in Nashville in the first, you know, month than I did in California a lot. Um, I think more like uh, uh, this part of the country. Um, the Nashville is interesting. You know, location mattered a ton pre-COVID for startups. Like pre, pre-COVID, I did all my deals in the Bay Area. And, um, you know, we used to joke, nothing east of Oakland, you know, uh, on the deal side. And then the founders, so I'd fund founders in the Bay Area, and then they would put most of their team in the Bay Area. And it was rare. Every once in a while, you'd have an overseas team, you know, in Poland or somewhere that could that was really deep in like you know, machine learning or something like that. But for the most part, everybody was kind of in one geography. And then COVID hit, and my founders opened up hiring nationally and somewhat internationally. And people realized that hey, these online tools we've been building for two decades actually are kind of good. Um. And then my founders started scattering. So when COVID was starting to come to an end, I'm like, awesome, we can do, we can be back in person. And like, I tried for eight weeks and I had like three in-person meetings. I'm like, okay, location is suddenly uh, irrelevant now. So I said to my wife, where do you want to be? And it took her, you know, two seconds to say Nashville because my daughter uh, was planning and now is in two weeks, she starts at Vanderbilt Children's as a nurse. Um, So for her, it was like, took two seconds. I'm the nerd. So... I had to build a spreadsheet with 20 cities and 20 attributes, build the scoring algorithm and uh, Nashville won actually, uh, even after that. So we moved and it's really fun. So um, I think it's a, it's a very interesting time for Nashville because I think Nashville has a lot of the core elements. Um, there's a lot of good people here. Uh, I've, I've commented how, you know, it's so refreshing to not have the bro factor in Nashville, um, people are humble. Like if anything, sometimes founders just need to need to channel a little bit of their inner Steve Jobs or Elon Musk, just a little bit. Not not not. Don't go the full Monty, but just a little bit uh, more self confidence sometimes. Um, but you have more, you know, kind of corporate headquarters, more customers, more real business here than in the Bay Area. So you're closer to. An end customer, you're closer to understand their unmet needs better. Uh, you got great universities here, and and you got these big employers that are bringing more and more people in, um, like Oracle and Amazon. And so all the pieces are there. I'd say the hardest thing, which you know I've been encouraging Zap to do this, is just being able to discover who's doing what. Uh, in the Bay Area, it's easy, right? You open up TechCrunch, and you know you see exactly what's going on um, here. There's a lot more great stuff going on than than is easy to discover. So just understanding who's doing what, and then there's there's some really good core understanding here. I think there's a lot of basic, you know, a lot of folks that are really capable that just a little more coaching on the basics can really help. Which again is where I've been uh, been seeing a lot of stuff you're working on. It's awesome. Um, where. Startups aren't that hard. The startups are hard, but what to do is not that hard to know. But there's a lot of people running around claiming to be smart at startups that 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 make make it make founders less likely to be successful than more likely to be successful. That's true of venture investors too. Uh, there are a lot of a lot of people create confusion, but it's not that hard uh, to be to point you in the right direction. And so just a little more education, a little more focus, a little more finding each other, a little more connecting. Um, you know, any investor now will fund startups anywhere if they have a chance to uh, yield uh, big outcomes. So, you know, every single investor in the world is a candidate for funding startups here. Um, but you got you got to tell the story and got to help people find them. And when they find them, you got to make sure they're talking the right talk and credible. Um, you know, uh, you don't want to make rookie mistakes when you got your chance to get, get funded by the right people. Um, so it's, it's been fun. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's, it feels like 
the Bay Area probably 30 years ago or Austin 10 years ago or Indianapolis five years ago, right? There's a real opportunity, but it's, it's uh, just a little more coordination, a little, little up-leveling. I think uh, there's no reason why somebody couldn't build a really valuable and important uh, startup here versus anywhere else. Thanks, Tim. Uh, I'd love to open it to audience questions now. What questions do people have? Please raise your hand. So if you were me, what advice would I give you? Uh, what big problem do you want to solve in the world? I want to help people get out of corporate America and start their own companies, become entrepreneurs. Awesome. Well, I think you're in the right place. <laughs> so, um, what unique skills do you have? Do you feel like you have that you feel most alive using to solve that problem? So I do contract negotiations across America and I know how to sit down and build relationships. And ultimately that's what business is. Okay. And then what have you done so far to solve that problem? Well, I started a nonprofit to help women start companies. Beautiful. It sounds like you're on your way. Is it working? Uh, we're brand new. We have a lot of traction. I just need the capital. Do you have happy customers? Uh, I do. Do you have a business model? I do, yes. So for every dollar you spend to recruit a uh, female founder that you coach, how fast do you get $2 in gross margin? Figure that one out. Because the key to get capital is to not need capital long term. And there's an overall income statement for a business and ultimately profits on the overall business is what is the weighing machine of the stock market. Uh, short term, it's more of a voting machine. Well, there's a, a kind of a mini income statement in every company that replicated over and over and over again. I call it unit economics. So in these kind of come in a, if you're Warren Buffett and you're funding C's candy, your dollar of investment in recurring revenue is, is a factory. So you take a dollar and invest it in CapEx and how much profit, you know, how much candy comes out the other side. In tech uh, related companies, your investment in recurring revenue is sales and marketing. So for every dollar you spend to go get a, a, a female founder to work with you, um, the key is how fast you make two in gross margin from working. And then if you take a dollar off your balance sheet, turn it into two and put two back on your balance sheet, well, then the next two dollars to f are coming from customer collections, not from VCs. So the only role the VC is is to provide some of those dollars to get those unit economic the, get the unit economic flywheel working. Um, Ninety nine percent of VCs will only invest after that's working. Now they won't articulate it this simply; they'll ask a million questions. But at the end of the day, that's really what it's all about. So as soon as you can get your unit economics working, and then you may not need any money. And when you don't need money, that's when 99% of VCs really want to give it to you. But then it's more just getting it, it's, it's accelerating that flywheel versus proving that flywheel. So as early as you can prove that flywheel. And before you even start, whiteboard out, hey, okay, I'm, how am I going to, what channel am I going to use to get to my customer? And then how am I going to get paid? And what's the cost to get a customer versus what I can get paid by having that customer? And if you figure that out, then you're on, then you're on your way. Um, does that make sense? Yeah, it's awesome. It's an important mission. Yeah. Great timing. Yeah. So I love the, uh, the two page, uh, ideas and you said you have about 30 at that time. How do you, how do you determine what you focus on and all, are you kind of revisiting those, flushing one, throwing one out and you're like, oh, that was great six months ago, but not anymore. Here's another one. Kind of what's your, kind of, what's your process work there? Yeah, it's, it's, it's iteration. Uh, so I, I'll review the whole list pretty regularly. Um, I probably spend four hours a day, uh, researching. I'm, I'm just, you know, reading, uh, LinkedIn's awesome. I got 25,000 connections on LinkedIn. Um, so it's like a big cocktail party every day. Like, you know, just learning people post just amazing things there. Um, and so when there's an industry that I'm intrigued about, like in like apartments, I probably now have 500 connections on LinkedIn um, in the apartment industry. I'm just learning, just a sponge, learning every day. Um, so it's if you're curious, which I, you know, I love learning. Um, it's just, you know, tons of time and effort 
just learning and seeing data and what, you know, what's working and what's not. And, and, uh, you know, anything you can learn from somebody else's experiment that you don't have to run yourself. It's a beautiful thing. Um, so it's a lot of research and then, uh, it's a lot of just working with founders. So, you know, I, you learn about, um, industries by being in a deal in an industry. So, you know, you kind of have to get a little lucky on your first one or two in this space because it doesn't always work great. Um, uh, but you learn a lot from the current ones. So, um, you know, I have a bunch of companies doing AI and they're all learning from each other. Right. And my most recent AI deals are way better than the early ones I did just because I, I learn a lot. So you just constant state of learning. And then I'm constantly meeting founders and it helps really hone, uh, the learning, uh, the best is when you have a two pager and you've been hunting, hunting, hunting. This was like Curtis at cloud apartments. Like I probably had my two pager on cloud apartment on, on, uh, on apartments for two years. And then Curtis, you know, pitches me and I'm just like, we're like completing each other's sentences. Uh, that's when it's really fun. It took me like 15 minutes to say yes to Curtis. So, um, and then, you know, it's just, uh, the more you're, the longer you do it, the more it gets easier to screen. Um, so what, what attributes do you screen for in a founder? And founder picking is the hardest one. Like you can learn markets pretty fast, but you know, I wish I had a PhD in psychology or psychiatry or sociology or something, right? To, you know, that's been the longest learning of how do you pick the founders and then how do you adjust your style to be most effective with each founder? Because each founder is so different. Um, so it's a lot like it's a lot like uh, I've read every book about or by a college head coach, like Nick Saban, Lou Holtz. Uh, it's the closest job to mine where, you know, oftentimes the best thing you can do is put your arm around them, right, and just encourage them. And sometimes you got to give a little tough love. And um, so each founder is different in terms of what they react best to in terms of how you coach them. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, sure. Uh, founder, CD coach. Um, I love that you said it, sometimes it's love because that's where preparation meets opportunity. Uh, my question, I have like 700 questions, but like my question uh, for you because of that last question is as a founder looking for a coach or a VC specifically, how do we verify and validate that moment that much? I, I too came from the West Coast coming back to Nashville home. Uh, and out there, it was easier to identify. How do you, what's your suggestion for this? For founders picking coaches? Yeah, how am I validating that? Because most of them are still in. Yeah, well, the good news now is kind of, no matter where they are, you know, they'll, they'll engage anybody. You know, largely distance has, be, location has become not a big factor in determining what deals you do. So, you know, um, you know, follow a hundred of them on, you know, if you're early stage, follow 100 pre-seed seed investors on LinkedIn. 80 of them will probably follow you back without knowing you. And then, uh, and then learn and listen and see who's posting things that resonate with you, right? Um, and then look at what they're doing and think about how you can add value to them, right? Uh, tech is really very much of a add value and then extract value later. Like, you know, I probably coach 200 to 250 uh, kids uh, from Notre Dame a year. That's where I went undergrad. And, you know, you just go in and I'll take a call with any of them. Um, and you just try to help them. And it's interesting. It's usually those three questions I asked, I asked you, right? What big problem do you want to solve? What skills you have? And what have you done so far? Amazing how few have thought through that first question. So it's fun. We can, in 10 minutes, we can usually get them focused on something meaningful. Um, and uh, so try to add value, you know, try to get into the ecosystem by plugging in and LinkedIn's a great way to do it. And then try to add value um, and start building those relationships. Um, the usually, you know, everybody says the best way to get a VC is to get referred, right? You ask for advice, you get money. And if you ask for money, you get advice. The old phrase, right, is, uh, you know, try to ask good questions and get advice. And then it only takes one that really hits. Um, so, you know, just get plugged in, I'd say would be the biggest advice. 
We're, uh, what are your initial reactions to a founder that says they're like industry agnostic? To a founder that's industry agnostic? Um, the concept or their solution. It depends if they're a first timer or a repeat founder. If they're a repeat founder who's had one success and they're like, hey, I'm pretty flexible on what problem I go solve next, that's okay, usually. Because they kind of know what they're doing and they got that, you know, they got that grit to get to the end. Um, in first time founders, I want to see passion. Well, I guess when I say industry agnostic, meaning like targeting a specific audience versus non specific uh, audience. Like the problem's the same. It's just. So you got a solution and you're trying to pick, pick focus? Uh, not necessarily trying to focus. It, and we're able to solve the problem for a lot of people. So it's not just like, let's target. Uh, so we're a no-code mobile app owner, so you can make a mobile app. Um, yep. So, like, a church who wants to build an app to the church or a school or a small business, like, you're, not, you're, not, you're kind of industry agnostic. You're not just honing in on that one specific organization, but the problem is still the same. I got gotcha, you. I got gotcha. you. Yeah, it's... So, question is, do you end up going to market horizontally or vertically? Do you pick one specific narrow customer or you kind of, you know... Those are, when you build horizontal solutions, those are the most nerve wracking for me. Because if you, you've got this tremendous potential. Um, but if you pick your vertical wrong to start with, you know, you can kind of screw it up. Um, so those are the ones that you end up, I, I end up spending the most time sort of thinking about, fretting about. Are you picking the right vertical? In general, as you analyze the verticals you can go after, um, which one have the best chance for good unit economics? So spend a dollar, how fast you get to, right? So, um, you know, selling to nonprofits, you know, nonprofits are tough customers, right? Government historically has been tough customer enterprises, you know, in general startup gets to charge about 10% of the value that they can document, right? So I would have you analyze all your different potential uh, channels, customer verticals, and where do you solve the most pain? And where do you have the best shot of when you collect 10% of that pain, having your cost of customer acquisition being far less than what they're willing to pay? Um, there's no right, there's no, it's usually not black and white. It's an iteration process, but man, horizontal solution, vertical go to market, man, you always, you always hope you pick the right vertical. Uh, so you can do a little testing in a couple of verticals and, um, and then think about what's changed, you know, where's the biggest change from five years ago, right? Um, you know, where's the biggest need? What, you know, uh, pairing what you're doing with some of the AI innovation that's going on would be fascinating to think about, right? And where do, you know, you know, uh, every time there's been a big outcome you can always point to the answer to that why now. So think about that as you think about your different verticals. Where's the biggest change happen that would point you at one vertical versus another? But yeah, it's, I don't envy you. It's an awesome opportunity, but nerve wracking to pick the vertical, right? Um, my name's Amy Tipton, and I'm with whitesmoven.org. We uh, teach women how to become entrepreneurs. We launched in December. We had a meeting in Memphis, Nashville, and I'm originally from Terre Haute, Indiana. Awesome. The pretty part of Indiana. Terre Haute's got hills like Tennessee. Fort Wayne is like tabletop flat. The town where everything was put on a tab. So I didn't have to pay. My grandfather paid. But Nashville, we came here during the school year in Dixon, this little area. And so I've seen this area change rapidly. It's one of the uh, miracles that's happening in the nation as far as growth and expansion. Unbelievable since the 90s. I'm amazed. So you said you're going to build affordable apartments in Nashville, right? I'm just curious. Right now, everybody's concerned about food, supply chain, and health, right? Everybody wants healthy food in their bodies. Are you going to incorporate organic farms around those apartments so the supply chain is on a local level? Um, so I've got a different solution for food than what you're proposing. Um, changing, changing the food supply chain, I've analyzed that a lot and I haven't, I haven't figured out a way to change the supply chain yet. But the uh, last 
10 mile distribution is fascinating. So um, if you're, so 85% of us can afford to pay retail for food, right? Everybody in this room, right? Probably afford to pay retail for food. And in three miles of here, you have hundreds and hundreds of choices, right? Lots of grocery stores, lots of restaurants, right? If you're in the 15% of people, the, today there's 42 million people hungry right now in America. If you're in that 42 million, that bottom 15%, right? Uh, you have to figure out, you have the least access to transportation and you have to figure out how to go past all of these other restaurants and grocery stores that are available to us to get to the soup kitchens and the food banks. Um, you know, we were talking about Dollar General before. Uh, the fact that Dollar General is based here, Dollar General could innovate like crazy in this area. So now that they're based here, I'd love to get connected with the CEO. So I've got this old drone company called uh, Zipline. So if you go flyzipline.com or search Zipline on, on YouTube, there's an awesome video that describes it. And we make these drones. We have two versions, one that has a 10 mile radius and can drop a payload within about a one square foot accuracy area. And we got another that's got 50 mile radius that can drop within, it drops a payload off of a, a paper parachute and it can drop in like a two parking spot um, uh, area of accuracy. And we've saved like 10,000 lives already in the developing world, delivering food and, uh, or delivering medicine and uh, blood and vaccines and all kinds of stuff. Where we've been honing the technology, math. It's basically a software company, but wrapped in, in hardware and massive amount of software, right? Collision avoidance, uh, amazing stuff. Um, and uh, we just announced, so we just got FAA approval in the US, which took forever. And we just announced we'll launch soon in Dallas Metro, um, where Walmart, so if you order groceries on walmart.com, you can buy with your SNAP EBT card, you know, your food stamp card. Um, and then they'll, it'll get loaded into a zipline drone and delivered to you within minutes. And it's a few cents of electricity cost to do the last 10 to last 50 mile radius. Well, food's a huge problem for single moms. I'll tell you. Amazing. And cost of living is the other problem. Yeah. So food, if you take that, you know, hierarchy, you know, that the income statement of the average income family, right? Uh, uh, housing's number one. You know, cars are number two. Interesting innovation cars, by the way. Uh, food's up there, right? Um, so if we can take the cost out of last 10 mile delivery, you know, Walmart's within 10 miles of 90% of the US population. So 90% of food deserts go away if there's a zipline launcher on every Walmart, right? And then there's tons of excess food in the supply chain. So we throw, about, throw away about 20% of food. So 15% of people can't afford to be retail for food and we throw away 20%. Well, now if you include that extra food in those shipments to Walmart, right? You can get a charitable deduction as the supplier. But then if they come order from Walmart and you get extra food, right? Along with it, that doesn't cost you anything. It's all, you know, there, there's a salute, there's a technology enabled system solution to this problem without having to blow up everything around how supply works and everything so far. So we'll see. So Zipline's had really good success at fundraising. Um, so it's valued now about 4.2 billion. I invested it 4 million free. Um, and we should be fully funded to break even, which is the most important thing. Um, but at, you'll see this over the next two, three, four or five years rolling out. Uh, Google's got this thing called Wing. And we've got Zipline. Those are kind of the two biggest competitors. Others ones trying around. But I'd be shocked if in a couple of years, you can be pretty much anywhere in America. You're hungry. Press a button on your phone and you can get healthy USDA food pyramid food delivered within seconds. And then if you look at all the cost that goes into running the food bank and soup kitchen business model, right? We give bad food to people with the least capability of getting there in the most inconvenient uh, places. So if we can run a technology layer on top of the same food supply and distribution chain that the 85% of us use, 
just a tech layer. It's like Uber, Uber did this cool little mini tech layer um, that sat between people who needed a ride and people who needed a little extra income and had a car. Right, really simple tech. But they, they built a new technology-enabled system solution. Right, they built a new transportation system with a really thin tech layer. I think that's where you do it. Some of these innovations are really powerful, like in food, but just zip line, right? It's hard, but just that one thing. And then you think about it as a system solution. You can completely get rid of uh, almost all food deserts um, quickly. So we'll ship a lot of other stuff in it. But, uh, but the food one, I was just trading notes with the founder the other day. I want him to do a, um, a zip burrito. So we got zip line, right? So work with the USDA folks to figure out, you know, a thousand calories a day for a kid, um, design a burrito that's healthy, tasty, and has all the calories a kid needs, uh, to be able to not be hungry. And then partner with Walmart to get that built at scale and then have these frozen burritos that people can just order via the zip line application or the Walmart app. And in seconds you get minutes, you get your, all the food you need to be uh, not hungry. Right. Can you imagine 42 million people hungry? So those are the kind of things that you can, you know, you can go build the 10th dog walking application. Right. And you might make great money. Rover, two billion, awesome. Uh, but man, if you can end hunger, or homelessness, or poverty, that's when. To me, that's what gets me jazzed. And just to add real quick to that, um, I heard of um, called foodharvest.org, and he collects like from farmers and everything the wasted. So maybe you want to. All that stuff's awesome. Uh, there's a company called Imperfect Foods that takes food that would otherwise be thrown away and. Makes it available and all that kind of, you know, anything around that. It's all about how do you get it and how do you get it in front of the people who are hungry? Yeah. And any solution that solves that problem, I'm yeah. excited about. So my question in regard to what you answered previous people, because you said how, uh, how fast can you get $2 back after you spend one? Yeah, and $2 in gross margin. In gross margin, mm -hmm. yes, sorry. Um, and then you talked about, you know, having an ethical business model as well. And I struggle with that idea of like, you know, what is a ethical margin on the product? How do you, like what is, do you have a process to determine what is an ethical um, margin? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm kind of of the mind that you can make max money possible as long as you're delivering max value to your end customer, right? Uh, like uh, we're, uh, China, um, Cloud Apartment is going to be a tremendously profitable business, you know, knock on wood, my, my apartment company. Um, if we made money and we made so much money that we caused our customers to lose money, our customers be hurt rather than help, that's a bad business. How do you know? Uh, I don't know. It's, uh, you know, if we, if we charge $300 less than market, that's good. We charge a hundred less a market. That's good, right? If we charge, um, we're going to have all uh, what's called a eighty AMI um, uh, median income. So people that are earning eighty percent of the median income in an area is where we're targeting. Um, so there's some metrics for that kind of stuff. It's there's it's not an exact science, but it's kind of you know you know it when it sees it. You know it when it's when you see it. Yeah, I mean, there's some metrics, but it's like, you know, hey, fundamentally, are the customers better or worse by using your product, right? It's like all these politicians that launch these lotteries, right? That's awful, right? The average person who's part participating in the lottery, you know, the average return is half of what they put in. So you expect a return, put in a dollar, you get 50 cents. That's, you know, that's capitalizing on people that, you know... So I wouldn't be a part of that, right? Uh, sports betting has attracted a tremendous amount of funding. But 5% of people who do sports betting end up getting so addicted, they ruin their family. Yeah. So I don't want to be a part of that. Um, but for instance, you know, pharmaceuticals, the attack, like mental health is a big issue, right? Yeah. So, I mean, putting a price tag on, on a health solution, you know, yeah. on a drug. On a yeah. To me, it's just got to be, I don't know if there's an exact answer in any of it. It's got to be kind of, 
win. It's not a, to me, the best businesses are win-win. So, you know, a drug company that prices drugs so high that their customers or, you know, can't buy their kids food. Like I wouldn't want to, if I was on the board of that company, I'd ask the question, you know, I don't know if there's a right answer. Wrong. There's some things that are just inherently like by their nature, like, you know, uh, um, you know, buy now, pay later fintech startups. Um, but you said, you know, spend one, get two. Well, what if you spend one, get three, or get four, or get five? That that's beautiful as long as your customers thrive in two, I think. So you just have to get there. As long as it's win, to me, as long as it's win win, right? Life's good. Right? Um, like I think in cars, this, uh, this Waymo and crew stuff I'm following really closely. Cars are the second largest expense for the average income family. Um, you know, people are spending six fifty to a thousand dollars a month per car times two cars, but they use it an hour a day. And when it breaks down, it's one of the top two reasons why families get behind on rent. Right. right? So if you can replace that with a three hundred and fifty dollars subscription access to a fleet of Waymos, and they come to you empty, and you get in the driver's seat and drive to your destination, get out, and it goes to the next requester, you can probably have six to eight subscribers for every car in the fleet. So now Waymo's making huge money. They're making a couple thousand dollars a month per vehicle, but consumers are saving massive dough. Okay, last question. So that seems a win-win to me, right? So I don't know if it, it's- but do you, Would you ever like ask a survey to test the business model before you launch? We do that a lot. Okay. Yeah, in general, you wanna, you wanna do as much research as you can on your potential solution before you ever write your first line of code. Yeah, uh, you can learn a lot before you write code, and it's a good thing to do. And my, I back a lot of tech founders in there. You can just see their like their social anxiety scream in their head when they when I'm telling them to go talk to people, right? Versus write code. Uh, but now there's electronic ways to do those things, so they tend to do them. All right, we have time for one more question. Uh, I was going to ask, I saw your Tim Talks about a couple of the ideas you mentioned there. Are you planning on bringing that back at all? And what's a couple of your favorite books you read last year? Oh, man. Um, yeah, Tim Talks is this fun little experiment. Uh, I've got to get it uh, going again. Um, where I Basically, I have this summary of stuff I've written. i happy to share it with anybody. You can get it through Zap. Um, but it's just kind of a bunch of advice uh, that I've given to founders over the years. And um, so I trained a GPT engine on it. Um, so it could answer any question. Um, now it's actually pretty good. And then it sends me every question and what the automated answer was. And then I can edit the answer. So I get a little FAQ that gets better. Um, but it's between engines. Uh, so I got to get it back going, but I'll get it back going again. Uh, it's a lot of fun. Um, books. Oh gosh. Uh, I don't know. Um, I read more online than long books. Um, uh, there's a, there's a great book called homelessness is a housing problem. Uh, that's the most recent book I read a lot of really great research validation of a lot of the things we're working on for homelessness. That's probably my favorite recent one. Awesome. Thank you guys so much for being here and thank you, Tim. Let's give him a round of applause. And then you can reach me on LinkedIn. Um, pretty easy to find. Happy to connect with you. And if I can be helpful on anything, you know, let me know. I'll add one more thing. If you, you know, want to talk about capital, we host office hours here weekly, uh, in person Wednesdays from 9 to 11 a.m. with me. So they'll be happening tomorrow. Next week, they're not happening, though. But I'll send a link um, to everyone who registered for this event after if there's anything questions, you're wondering about something, don't know what's next, come to office hours. Thanks.